Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Foreman Community Demo. My apologies to those of you that were confused by the hour because of uh, daylight savings, the time changed, uh, the calendar, the events calendar was not updated, uh, the events page and the discourse event page uh, were actually correct. Thanks to Mark for bringing that to my attention. It was changed today. Hopefully everyone saw it on time. For any questions, uh, we're on the foreman on IRC, Twitter, or the YouTube live chat. Today, uh, Avi is co-hosting with me. Say hey, hello. everyone. <laughs> I'm Avi. I'm happy to be here. Avi will start hosting the UX demos that we have uh, next Wednesday will be the first one that he's hosting. So he's joining today uh, to help out and get to know our demo. Yeah, and stay tuned because it's going to be very soon. For every, anyone watching this on YouTube later, please check the video quality. The default is not great for our screen sharing. So we have um, a lot of areas today, logging, audits, audits templates, we have two release candidates that were released uh, for Catello 3.6 and Foreman 117. Thank you for everyone that tested our first release candidates. Please continue and test the second one so we can get out these versions soon. We have Mark starting today. There are a few things Mark is demoing today. So let's start with the custom notifications for Insights. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, hopefully I enlarged the font so you can see that. Um, so the first feature I'm going to show is uh, custom uh, notifications uh, for uh, remote execution jobs, basically. Um, and I worked on that uh, as part of the integration with the Insights plugin. And uh, this feature is quite small, but in order to demonstrate it, I need to uh, show you the whole workflow. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with the Insights plugin, it's a plugin that adds you another menu in here and uh, basically integrates with the Red Hat Insights service, uh, which gives you, as the name suggests, uh, some insights about your infrastructure. So um, in here, you can see the overview of the, or the Insights dashboard, let's say, and you can see that I have just one host in here, but Insights already identified few problems in here. Um, actually, it tells me about three security issues. So if I go and investigate in details what's going on, um, I will see that these three issues, one is some vulnerability in, in kernel I'm running in there. And uh, one of them that I'm gonna use here is that uh, I don't have the product signing key installed, the GPG key is missing in RPM. So as you can see in here in this table, some of these uh, uh, rules or uh, security actions have um, Ansible, uh, playbook in here that you can use to actually remediate uh, the problem. So uh, if we go to details of this rule, we'll find all the hosts that are affected by that. Uh, right now, it's just this host. But uh, you can basically create a remediation plan, which is the thing I'm going to do in here. So the remediation plan, uh, basically, you can you can add multiple hosts, multiple rules, and uh, store it as a, as a plan. So I'm going to call it. Uh, problem. Um, now, when I save that, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, let's say, happy with the plan, uh, I can uh, actually execute that. So there are multiple ways how to do that. Uh, so far, there has been this option to download the playbook. Um, so if I had more systems or more, multiple rules, I could uh, get the playbook that contains all of that. But what we added is the integration with the uh, form an Ansible plugin, which is now integrated into form and remote execution. So uh, you can actually run the playbook right away from here. So um, you just click on this run playbook and it should redirect me to the job invocation page um, and starts the starts the playbook execution on that host. A um, few demos back, I, sh I demonstrated that we added a notifications for remote execution job. So now I could go and work with my uh, performance system, and once uh, the job finishes, I should see the notification. And this is like the crucial part of this demo. We uh, added a way to uh, further customize the notifications. Um, so if this is, uh, 
if this is a specific job uh, invocation for an insights run or insights feature, uh, I will have a different notification here. We already see it pops up. Before I open that, you can see that this is the playbook that was actually generated for a given plan ID. So now if we go and look at the notifications, you can see that previously I had a few uh, job invocations uh, which were regular remote execution jobs. So they always were labeled like a job with the name has finished successfully. Now the label is different. Uh, it tells me that insights remediation has finished successfully. And also if I look at the details or uh, the links for a given notification previously for, or for regular uh, job invocations, I have just a link to the job details. But here I could further customize that and I could edit uh, a link to the plan. So if I click on the remediation plan, it takes me back to the uh, Insights plugin page. It will show me my plan uh, where I can see that this, this host uh, was already, uh, or the issue on this host was already resolved. Uh, now, one more thing I can show here, uh, if you want to further customize uh, the run or the remediation, there is an option to customize, uh, customize the playbook run. So this is useful if you know uh, you want to execute such remediation, but you want to use the full potential of the remote execution. For example, you can schedule it into future, or you can change the uh, other attributes of the run, like, for example, what user should be used for a connection or specify password, stuff like that. So uh, that's basically it. Um, so if you are a plugin author and you would like to have a, a Tailor notifications for features. I could imagine, for example, OpenSCAP plugin. It might be useful to have a custom notification with the custom links to uh, OpenSCAP uh, ARF report, for example, or any other plugin. Uh, it's quite easy. Uh, you just need to configure the remote execution feature and provide a specific uh, notification builder class for that. But I'm not going to uh, go into details. So that's it for this part. Thank you, Marek, uh, for presenting it. Uh, now we are going to show the audit improvements also from you, Marek. Uh, so let's see. All right. Um, so most parts or um, yeah, the, the, the biggest part that I'm going to demo about the audit improvements uh, was contributed by Tomer, uh, who's not available today. So uh, I'm demoing that on his behalf. Uh, we focused during the last weeks on improving the, the audit uh, feature we have in Foreman. So for those who are not familiar with that, audits, you can find them under monitor audits. And this page lists all the changes in your uh, of your uh, resources in your database. So uh, whenever a user changes uh, some attribute of, let's say, host or subnet, uh, you should see it here. And also, it this is like a log that persists even after you remove the resource. So in here, you can see that there was a provisioning template some time ago but uh, it was already destroyed. But if I would go to details, I would still see what were the attributes of that provisioning template. Um, so one thing that we improved is um, we added a definitions to more um, resources. And we went also over many plugins like uh, Catalo, which didn't have uh, any audit notification before um, or any audit uh, definition. Uh, so we extended. Um, nearly all plugins that I'm aware of that have uh, some models to be uh, audited. Um, and um, basically now you, you see all the resources in here. Um, we also, or Tomer added uh, scoping by organizations and locations. So if you go to, before the change, uh, you always saw all audits from all organizations on this page. But now if you change the organization to a different one, you see only audits uh, basically from that organization. Uh, obviously, it still works. If you go to any organization, you would see everything that happened in your foreman. So this is this is quite nice for uh, setups where uh, you have a multi-tenancy. Uh, how that works, uh, because we can't rely on the associations on the audited object, because as I said, some audits, or audits are persisted even after the resource is uh, removed. We basically snapshot the resource uh, organizations and locations associations at that time or at the time of the change and store it um, along with the audit. Uh, this has one downside, I would say. So if if I go to if, if I'm uh, let me go to domains, for example, and let me create a new domain uh, in the default organization. Uh, demo.org. So 
So now if I go back to audits page um, and refresh that, I see that the domain was created, but if I would go to the foreman page, I don't see that domain. This is another domain, the foreman.org. So if I go back to default organization, I see the record in here. The confusing part about this is that if I change the organization later, so I'm going to remove it from default organization, but add it to form an organization and hit, hit submit. So now when I go back to this audit page, I don't see any change. Um, perhaps I would expect that I see this, this domain is no longer available in that domain. Uh, but actually I would only find an audit record in the form an organization where I see the domain was changed and the organization was actually assigned to that. So that's something we probably will uh, want to address and we should probably create either two separate audit records or uh, somehow unify all the changes and uh, assign it to multiple organizations. But uh, it's like, this is the way how it behaves so far. Um, related to that um, is also this uh, section of the audit detail. So uh, Tomer added uh, a metadata in here. So basically we add more information like uh, the exact time of the audit, uh, who created that, and also all the affected organizations and locations because there can be multiple of them. Um, so that's mostly regarding the, the scoping of audits. Uh, another nice feature uh, that was added and that was kind of required because um, now when we edit multiple definitions, um, we have quite a lot of data in this audit table and there was no easy way to actually remove audits. So uh, to demonstrate that, uh, I'm gonna uh, connect to, uh, to one machine in here. Uh, so this is a developer setup. Uh, now, if I run a rake T audit, so what we, what uh, Tomer added is a rake task that helps you to clean the old audits because you might not be interested in audits that happened one year ago. It's basically, uh, it depends on, on your use case or your environment. Um, sometimes it's good to have the full history, but sometimes it's good to just get uh, rid of those data. Uh, so there's a new rake task, rake audits expire. So if you run it just like that, it's gonna, uh, this is a developer setup, so it's gonna print a lot of uh, debug lines in here, but we are mostly interested in the in the outcome at the end. And I guess I'll need to scroll out because I enlarged the font a bit. Uh, but basically what it does, it goes to the database, uh, searches for all the uh, audits that are uh, older than some date. In this case, it's uh, by default, I think it goes two months back and deletes everything in there. Since this is quite a new setup, I didn't have any audits in here, so I didn't uh, delete anything. But if you want to customize that, you can use a days parameter. So you can say something like days equal one. Uh, I wonder what would happen if I specified zero. I think it would delete all the audits, but anyway. I specified it as one, so we should see that it searches for uh, audits um, that are uh, also newer. newer. There is no uh, cron or any automated uh, run of this task um, because we, as I said, everyone has a different policy for deletion. So it's up to user to set that up. Uh, it's not like uh, cleaning of uh, config reports, but the rake task is provided. And we can see that the date in here has changed uh, so that the days was uh, effective. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's all regarding audits I have. We have one question uh, regarding version availability, uh, but just to mention, most of the features that we're showing on the community demo are things that were merged recently, so you can find them in Nightly. Um, but for these two, are there already target versions for the notifications and audits? So uh, customizable notifications are in uh, remote execution plugin merged, uh, but I think there was no release. So that's going to be next remote execution release, which I think will be in same time frame around Foreman 118. Um, and regarding the second part, regarding audits, that's already merged, but into nightly. So yes, again, that means uh, Foreman 118. I, I don't think we would cherry pick that into 117 because we are already after RC2. Um, so we only cherry pick really important bug fixes, no new features. Great, thanks. And the last thing by Mark today is templates importing from the API. 
Okay, so that's going to be a short one. Um, so one thing uh, that we added, and if you are familiar with the Foreman templates plugin, this is like a sub part of that, but now it was uh, kind of migrated into the Foreman core itself. So we added two new endpoints uh, to our API. If you're not familiar with the uh, slash API doc, it's a nice way to display all the API endpoints we have. So if you navigate to your Foreman slash API doc, you'll see similar page. So we have two new endpoints. Uh, these are in provisioning templates and P tables um, or partition tables. Uh, these are importing uh, endpoints. So if I go into details, or I'm going to open it here so it doesn't load for a long time. So basically, we added an endpoint to import a provisioning template. Uh, you can specify the parameters like location or organization in which you want to import the template. Then you specify template name and the template itself. This is the content of uh, the template, but it's not just, uh, let's say, a kickstart syntax or, or the template uh, that you render, but also it can contain a metadata. Uh, if you look at our community templates repo, you would see that uh, every template starts with a few lines commented out, which contains the metadata. So if you have this metadata as part of this template, we are going to parse them and uh, basically configure the newly created templates accordingly. And this behavior can be further customized uh, using these options. So for example, you can lock the template during the import. You can also specify a force so you can update existing locked template. Or uh, you can specify how we deal or how we handle the metadata. So um, you can only uh, apply the metadata when the new template is created, or you always apply them, which means you override that even if the template exists and is assigned to some specific organization or uh, operating system, for example. Or you completely ignore that if you specify never. So just to demonstrate that, here is the API call that I would do. Um, so I specify an organization ID. So the template is created in some specific organization. This is the template uh, attributes itself. So I provide a name. And then this is the multi-line string in a JSON um, with uh, slash n to uh, actually provide a new lines. And then uh, I use association uh, mode always, which means we always will use the metadata, which means this template will be created and assigned to the template kind uh, called finished. So if I run that, uh, now it should, it should succeed. So I give I get back uh, information about the newly created template. And if I go back to here and reload the page, I should see um, the template I just created. Oh, and I created in the, in the organization uh, with ID one, which is this one. So here you can see I created the template. It's automatically assigned as a finished template. And here is the content, including the metadata. And that's it. Thank you, Mari. Uh, I don't see any question on the IRC. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, we are going to Ivan. Uh, with the multiply que uh, queues supporting DynaFlow. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen and I hope it works. Uh, so I hope you see my screen now. Uh, so uh, what I would like to show you today is the feature that we added into the DynaFlow and extended the remote execution to use it, which is about the multiple queues uh, uh, that Dynaflow now supports. So the issue in, in the past that we had until this feature is that Dynaflow uh, didn't uh, distinguish between the work that it's supposed to do. And there was just one queue that all work was getting into and the uh, pool of workers was handling that uh, as they came. And the problem with this is if you have multiple tasks that some of the tasks that I contribute a lot of things on the queue and the and, uh, uh, work items take really short time. So that's one uh, kind of uh, work workload that the Dynaflow can handle. And there are other tasks uh, such as indexing, let's say, the content view or something like that, that take longer time. And the problem with the single queue is when you get multiple tasks such as uh, the uh, indexing of the content view, they can kind of overload and hold uh, the workers for much longer time uh, than uh, it would be nice to see. And some other features that require the short time uh, work items uh, are you know, waiting for that. So in order to isolate this kind of workflows, uh, we added the additional queue or support to for having multiple queues. With this, 
now every uh, action that is running through the Dynflow can specify which queue the work should go to. And there is a different set of workers that are sitting on this queue. So to demonstrate it, I will use the remote execution because that was the first plugin that actually uh, is using that. So I have here some a job on to run on 187 hosts. Um, and when I uh, reschedule that... Ivan, uh, I'm sorry to stop you, but can you please uh, scale up your screen so it's easier to read? Yeah, yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, and uh, when I go to the uh, Dialflow console into the status page, uh, and I load the execution item count. You can see that we have now two queues. One is the default. This is where all the work comes when the queue is not specified. And I have I have additional queue that I defined in the remote execution called remote execution. And I see that there are five workers in total, and uh, two of them are free, uh, so that I can you know see uh, the load of that. If I reload this. Uh, uh, again, as the execution proceeds, I see that more workers are actually free at the time. And like uh, the reason for this is that the remote execution uh, events or the work items really take short time. So like we don't even get the, the queue size or this is basically the amount of items waiting in the queue uh, to be processed. And as you see that we still have free workers the queue uh, is more like zero most of the time. If we had here some tasks regarding the indexing the content that would take, let's say, several uh, minutes, then uh, we could uh, uh, see some queue size uh, rises, especially if the amount of the free workers would be uh, zero, so that there would be less workers than uh, the incoming work. So that's really the feature. And I would like to also show how it's done on the code side for the plugin developers. It doesn't require any special deep dive because there are just two things to do. Uh, if one wants to define a new queue that would be uh, possible to use in Dynflow, then uh, the only thing one needs to add is in the performance task or even uh, the same works for the uh, uh, for the four main core, uh, it would be just different uh, start of this uh, method. The Dynflow config uh, has now the queues method that you can add a new queue. The Dynflow queue constant is just a symbol. And then we basically specify the size of the pool, uh, which means the amount of the workers that will be allocated to process this. So that's the, the number five here. Uh, and the second thing that the developer needs to do is in action itself, like define a method queue or override the method queue uh, and specifying the name of the queue to be used for this action. And uh, how, how it works is that uh, the this queue is also used for all the actions that are planned uh, as part of this action. So if you have some action that has some subparts, all the subparts would use this queue as well. Uh, unless specified uh, otherwise in the in the sub uh, sub plan uh, the last thing so for example in catalog if we wanted to use it uh, to, to use some actions or some tasks for a different queue we would need to do it just in one uh, action and not in every action that is part of the task uh, and the last thing to show is that we actually exp uh, expose the size of the execution, uh, remote execution workers pool via setting. So if there was a need to uh, to do some change or some tweaking of this size of the queue, when I go to the settings, uh, in the remote execution part, the there is the workers pool size, and I can, let's say, decrease it to number three. And I need now to restart the uh, server because uh, it needs uh, to know it uh, at the beginning when the Dynflow runtime is initialized. Uh, but uh, when that is done, uh, we need to wait for the server to be ready. Uh, but once it is, 
uh, I will show you again the Dynaflow console status page. I will not sing for you today. Okay, here we go. Uh, and when I load the execution items count, you can see the total workers is now three instead of five. So that's really uh, about this feature and just few uh, words about the future. So right now, the all the queues and, and thread pool is part of the single executor process. So like with this, we still will not be able to uh, like, uh, use more than 100% of the processor. We have support for running multiple executors, but uh, it's kind of uh, advanced feature. And what we would, we would like to do uh, in the future is uh, extracting this or the worker pool actually outside of the main executor so that we can scale up or down more efficiently, but that, that will require some uh, uh, more work on the Dynaflow side to able to do that. And the last thing I wanted to mention that that this multiple queues support it was also exposed inside or via the active job. So uh, through the standard active job uh, layout or uh, API for specifying the queue for the uh, job defined here, it would also like be used uh, by the Dynaflow and it would leverage or allow to use different queue for that. So that's really it. Uh, thanks for uh, all for watching. And if there are questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. Uh, so you already answered uh, the question that we had now, uh, which was about uh, exactly that the processes. So let's continue for now. If there are other questions, we'll get back to you. Sebastian with out of sync changes. Hi. So uh, recently we introduced Orange into Foreman. And based on that, we introduced now specific interval settings for hosts to report back. We still have the general out of sync interval, which determines an overall out of sync uh, regardless of the origin. And we have a specific interval setting for Ansible as well as the Puppet interval, which is here. In addition to this, we also took a look at the dashboard and started separating widgets based for these origins. You have still uh, the overall uh, view to see hosts that don't have any origin, um, or actually that uh, doesn't regard the origin. And you have the host configuration status list, as well as the chart for Puppet. Uh, this one here is empty because I don't have any Puppet hosts. Um, and we also have uh, the same for Ansible. And uh, the run distribution widget is also separated for all these origins. We still try to improve uh, this, as well as the integration of Ansible, and look forward to more feedback on this. And that is actually it. Yeah. OK. Uh, sorry, Sebastian, you were breaking up a little from from our side. I oh, uh, where did it break up? Oh, just your last sentence. That's oh, okay. uh, no, that was just it. Yeah, it took us a second to understand that sentence okay. because you broke up the last sentence. I don't see any more questions now. So let's move to our final presenter for today. Lukas with logging changes. All right, hello. And I shared my screen. And um, yeah, so logging changes. The, our goal uh, during this sprint uh, was to integrate, to improve our logging in our Rails, um, form and core, the main Rails application. And in the future, we'd like to extend this to other components, specifically Smart Proxy, and, uh, and integrate with other components. And the goal, uh, there are two major goals with this. Um, that's uh, to 
add structured logging, which seems as a good idea for uh, you know compon uh, systems with many components. You want to correlate, for example, correlation is one of the major issues we have. If you have logs from various components, you want to see actually the whole transaction across the, the components. One example would be creating the HCP record. Uh, so you have logs in form and core, in Redis application, in smart proxy, and also in the ISC DHCP server as well. So ability to have some extended you know, attributes, I can call it attributes or fields, extra fields like session ID, correlation ID, or request ID, and others, uh, that's important. And the second goal is also to have a unified logging to ability to integrate with uh, logging, central logging solutions. There are many out there. For example, Syslog itself can you know, send logs to remote machines, so or whole your server fleet can be configured to, your, to send the logs. In our case, uh, uh, all the servers with a uh, smart proxy installed can send logs using syslog. The various, uh, sorry, the same, the same uh, mechanism is in Journaly. Uh, and that's it's actually old mechanism H over HTTPS, uh, but uh, you know the outcome is the same. You have you're uh, you know having uh, log records on one server, rather one or multiple, uh, you know central. Places and of course there are other things like uh, ELK stash stack and uh, and uh, stuff like that. So two goals, uh, one feature. So what what what's done? This is a nightly uh, installed here, and as we as we speak here uh, today, uh, by uh, 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 we are working on the uh, install changes, but it's not yet uh, done. So uh, what I, what you want to do if you want to try this with uh, Nightly, you want to install a sub package form and journal D, which uh, adds uh, two more dependencies. These are Ruby gems. It's a separate uh, package because because uh, if you don't want to use journal D. Uh, it's a native gem, so maybe you don't want to even install it. And for development purposes, we sometimes are usually don't want to use journal for the logging. Uh, we are we're using logging uh, file appender, um, so that's the reason why it's separate. Uh, there's one problem. The, this package is actually, I just demos I create because um, you actually test on production setup what you've done. So and I was expecting this to be working, but when I installed Nightly uh, this morning, I realized that the, the package was not whitelisted in our, it's a technological thing. But anyway, it's not, it was not whitelisted. So there is a PR. Uh, so the package will be there over the night, hopefully tomorrow. So you need to install it, otherwise it won't boot. Now the second thing you want me to do is logging.yaml, ATC foreman slash logging yaml you can change this file or you can put all the logging changes from this yaml into settings yaml it's uh, uh, you know you can decide um, it's kind of um, this aims to be a default setting and you basically what you can do is you can copy uh, and paste from here to to your settings yaml if you prefer or you can even i think you can it's fine you can change this file directly here so what we've done, we created uh, some new uh, settings. Uh, so previously, uh, the most important was type, logging type. Uh, previously, um, the only supported logging um, endpoints or, or uh, logging facilities were file logger and syslog logger. Now we also added journal, journal D support. You enable that by uh, setting type to journal D or journal. That's the same, it's an alias. Um, the uh, you want to uh, which is new is uh, uh, layout is now configurable. It was just fixed to our pattern. We have uh, actually two patterns: multi-line pattern and logging pattern. You don't want usually to change that. Uh, the the multi-line pattern is used for development purposes, so that's this defaults to pattern. Uh, so that's not um, uh, it's not um, uh, yeah, important. There is one uh, uh, layout which, if if I search here, everything is commented here. The the third layout is JSON. So if you set the layout to JSON, 
here, JSON, like, just like that, you're ending up with uh, uh, log records in JSON format, which is interesting or important if you want to integrate with a third party tool and that imports JSON, most of them do, and you want to see all the additional flags we add, I'll show you in a minute how it, how it looks like. The, uh, the JSON is one of the integration you know ways you can you can you can have you can you can do so this was if you install nightly it's still set to file you know we default we, we haven't changed the configuration yet uh, or there i just started a discussion uh, on the community.forman.org uh, an hour ago about how how you how you guys feel about changing that to maybe syslog maybe journal uh, things like that there's uh, my analysis of what's what 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 what's, what new features you can expect from there so let's discuss and then we can finish the pr uh, the install P uh, pr now uh json items is uh, another field uh, similarly to layout that you would don't usually want to you know change it basically says if you set the layout to json what fields do you actually want you, you actually want the, in the JSON itself. Um, and there are a couple of options. If I, uh, again, search for JSON items, look in here is it's a lot, you know, log timestamp, level message, file nine, met method, log host, stuff like that. I, we pre-selected the same default here. Uh, obviously the most important is level message timestamp. What's important uh, is MBC and NDC. We are using a uh, gem for logging. We are us using gem called logging. It's a kind of a, uh, yeah, it's called logging. And it has a concept of nested diagnostic context and, uh, and that's NDC and message diagnostic context. We are using those to actually to add to, to enrich those uh, log messages to log records. So you want to include those, keep those uh, lines here. If you delete them, you are not actually getting advantage of the JSON. Well, well nothing really, you know, you are basically breaking up message and level only into two fields, but uh, but that's it. So keep them here. Don't change that. Uh, and previously we had a pattern here. That's this line was unchanged, I think. Uh, but we also have a sys underscore pattern, which is stands for system journal system syslog pattern. If you you can, it's, it's actually the same. There is a slight difference here. The the Person D, which is for that's for date time, date time and date, is not you know uh, in this. Uh, if you're using syslog or journal D, you don't want to actually send the uh, date time into the message itself because it's actually already present. You know the the system logger will actually assign the each log uh, uh, particular you know the, the date and time. That's the only change, and and as you can see, it's. For a better, you know, uh, transition phase, or for those who don't want to use structured logging or don't want to see those structured fields, because I'll, I'll show how how you can work with that. Uh, we are also included the um, uh, defaults we 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 are you know used to for some time now. That's the uh, that's the um, this is level. So that's. Uh, E for error. It used to be three characters. Error, E R R. I shortened it a bit uh, to one character. Hope you you like it. If not, then we can change it back. Uh, may, you know, raise your voice in the thread. And three characters of uh, of uh, logger name. So that's application permission stuff like that. And the three characters of the request ID. And then uh, the message goes on. So we are including it here. This is important for those who don't want to really use extra fields and want to see the messages, you know, as it, as as you are used to. So that's the that's the reason why are we. It's actually unnecessary. We are duplicating those fields are actually a variable somewhere else. And the last one is facility. This is a syslog facility. By default, we uh, ship with local six, which also is known as user six facility. And I'll show you in a minute how how you can leverage that. Um, basically, this uh, it's a number, it's a constant that is you know um, stick to uh, every single uh, log line, and you can use that to filter uh, easily filter uh, uh, log messages into let's say a separate file if you want to.
So that's it. So this is this is how it looks like if you have a nightly today, and that's this is not changing anything except maybe the three or certain director here. I was like saving some space. Um, and so let's configure that uh, with journal D. If you want to use structured logging, you need to either use journal D or you need to use JSON with either file or syslog. You can also send JSON to journal D, which is kind of a, you know duplicating because you already have the, the, those extra fields in in uh, in its uh, journal D database. So I will set it to journal. Type is journal, and we can. And I think that's that's all we need to do here. So I won't save it because uh, it, it was set actually to journal, yeah. And let's let's try how it how it looks like. So uh, by default, if you don't know, by default uh, on CentOS seven or well seven, um, there is a journal D running, and there's a syslog uh, running. Both you know it's R syslog and journal D. Both are running the. Uh, Journal D is running in what's called transient mode or non-persistent -per mode, which means that it maintains uh, a small buffer of uh, system D, journal D, conf of, I don't know, 15 megabytes. Uh, it's a ring buffer. And so all the latest uh, and greatest uh, the logs are in memory, and you can work with that using journal control. And everything is sent to, uh, or forward, it's called forwarding, forward to syslog here. Yes, this is the default of uh, CentOS or L or Fedora. I think in Fedora, that's not a long longer, that's no, no longer the case from several years, maybe versions ago. Syslog is no longer installed by default. You can, of course, still install it. But on RHEL 7, at least, uh, this is this is the default setup. And I believe this is the same uh, on Debian systems. I'm not sure. So by default, you can work with uh, journal control. Journal control. So let's see. I have a running uh, instance here. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, are you, I have no history, why? Journal, so journal, the, journal control, and now uh, we want to filter out a, a unit called HTTPD service. That's because I'm running, this is the production install, uh, instance I'm running uh, my uh, Rails uh, uh, using Passenger in HTTPD, so that's uh, why the unit name is called HTTP, on Debian that would be Apache2.service. Hopefully we get something. Okay, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know date, date, uh, uh, host name, and process name are you know those are fields that are automatically added here. Uh, let's do something else. Let's do if you do outputs to I think it's called short. No, it's called cut. Okay, cut. That's actually shorter. And those are the messages there. So you can, of course, you can do things like follow. So let's do dash F, you know, uh, that's, so let me just quickly do refresh here. Okay, it works. Now, what I want to do, this is not really, uh, no rocket science. What we want to do is to see it uh, using verbose, verbose. So if I do verbose, this is what we are actually looking for. So we have a message here. And we also have those extra fields which we send uh, over the system, the journal, the API. Uh, let's go top bottom. So all the underscores are automatically set by uh, journal D. We, we set a syslog facility, a syslog identifier. So we can use these in syslog. If you have a syslog configuration, you want to send those logs into whatever separate file, separate server, whatever, you can use that. As you can see, here is a form and logger. It's app. Again, this is the duplication uh, info message app. And session, uh, it's not uh, because the notification doesn't have a session here. Let me just scroll down to something with session. Um, uh, here, so uh, form and logger app, okay, underscore uh, remote IP. We also send remote IP. Here's a session and request, those are provided by. Rails, but the session is actually, this is for security, this is not this real session, it's just a unique ID that is put into a session. So you can't, you know, uh, get the session for, I mean, that's uh, increased security. 
And what we have priority is all properly set. This field is, you know, expected by journal D. So it's a number. Um, journal D has has some kind of a level, log level concept, of course. And that's pretty much. Uh, we should also have user user login. If there is a logged user, we have a log uh, username. And we also send set organization and location IDs if that's available. So that's obviously not always available, but if you have the context, we set it, send it as well. If you have a, an exception, we also set exception class, exception name, and exception backtrace in uh, individual uh, fields so we can easily filter. Uh, so this is how we, you can work with this. Let me quickly check my papers, patterns, facility. OK. and. Uh, by default, again, uh, if you want to take advantage of this, you need to actually enable persistent journal, uh, and you do this by creating a, a directory. So if you create a var log journal, it will start. You know, journal D will notice then, and or you need to restart it. I'm not sure, and you know, and we will be logging all the journal. You know, with the extended fields there, so you can use con system con uh, sorry um, journal extract the things. Of course, you can do a search. You can filter by, you know, that's, we, we, we will not going, we'll be not going through that. To just um, use the, or, or read the man page of the uh, journal control. Now, uh, as I've said, all the logs are also going into uh, uh, syslog. So in our case, uh, that would be here, var log messages. So we should also see all the log the lines here, and that's what is going on actually. Uh, it's a change. So if we decided, if we decide to change default from a file logging to syslog, that would be a, some kind of a big change. On the other hand, it's pretty easy to configure syslog to send those logs to uh, to uh, back to the file we all ex ex uh, expect it to be. And it's actually uh, let me just quickly uh, quickly find the the line. Uh, you need to drop uh, this line local dot. Uh, uh, so that's the uh, syslog facility local six, and that you need to drop this into ATC syslog. Is that a syslog? Uh, ATC maybe help me here uh, somewhere uh, where where, where uh, syslog has the uh, RC syslog. All oh, right, that's the that's the one here. So four month conf and here and from now on, you know, you'd end up with all the logs from you know on the expected uh, you know place. That's uh, something we maybe can uh, introduce. Uh, you know, we'll see how the discussion goes. So the next steps. This is what we have currently in nightly. Uh, the next steps for, will be in the next sprint. I'll be working on documentation on how to integrate this with uh, some with actually a ELK stack. So I'll end up, um, you know, either with documentation piece or blog post about how to start gathering logs using LAK from Foreman. Uh, and those who are already using LAK can start right now. It's I don't expect uh, that to be uh, problematic. It should be some kind of a just configuration. I'll expect to use uh, JSON perhaps uh, for the for the easiest um, integration. And uh, the next sprint, uh, I would like to also start working on the logging, uh, a little bit more simplified, but based on the logging gem, uh, similar approach for smart proxy. So we have also, you know, ideally, we'll end up with all the logs either in journal or syslog on both smart proxy and, and foreman, and we can uh, even um, uh, write a blog post about how to enable logging into central place that could be a foreman server or a different server and uh, that's the uh, beginning of uh, really nice uh, logging uh, logging uh, for your deployment and that's pretty much it any questions thank you marik uh, so i don't see any question uh, so thank you marik i don't see any question on the irc thank you thank you lucas <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have any question, any future, 
future question, you can find us on the IRC, on the free node. Uh, you can find us on the Twitter, on the discourse. And thanks for watching and take care.